and away you can go. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Andrew McCaskill. Um, figured I'd at least show my face because you're going to wash my hands most of the time. <laughs> it seemed kind of awkward. So at least for those 50 of you that are here right now, you can see my face. Maybe you'll see it later on again, but uh, the focus is going to be on the cells when I move the camera over here a second. Um, basically, today we're going to just talk about the different cells that Gamry has to offer, um, what applications we would use those for, how to set up the cells, different configurations for the cells, um, and hopefully this will give you an idea first how to use our cells if you have them um depending on the cells that you might have they might not be ours but still they can help you get a better idea of how to use your cell properly uh if you're making custom cells maybe we give you some ideas um and yeah this is just education about cells and connectivity um and well let's, let's get started you'll see what i'm talking about let me get this set up here All right, so as you see in the background, we have many of our potential stats, and I'm gonna connect each of these to various cells depending on um, the application that would probably work best for it. Um, and then as I go through each cell, uh, we'll talk about uh, how I constructed it, what it's used for, why it was designed the way it was, what kind of samples it can uh, um, uh, handle, um, the kind of experiments you would run for it, and then if, any of you have a question, right in the middle of the talk, I'll stop and, and we can address it. So kind of want this to be very interactive. Um, don't wait to the very end uh, to ask your question. If you have a question, just uh, contact one of the hosts and um, we'll see if we can answer it for you while I have the cell set up and uh, see, if, see how that works. So this is kind of a trial and error. Hopefully it goes smoothly, um, but just bear with us and uh, we should get through everything. So the first cell that I wanted to show, it's one of my favorites, it's probably one of our most elegant cells. It's actually the paint test cell here, uh, PTC1. And this cell, here let me put this behind here to kind of isolate what we're looking at a little bit. It's so busy back there. Uh, so this cell is primarily designed for testing coated samples. And you can see right here I have a coated sample. I scratched off some of the surface uh, to expose the metal beneath. but have a coated sample here and uh, um, running electrochemical experiments on coated samples can be a fast and effective way to uh, characterize the coating uh, as opposed to uh, doing long exposure experiments and just doing uh, maybe a, a weight loss or, or um, visually inspecting the coating after weeks of, of testing. So this is a faster way that, that you can test uh, coatings. And uh, this is a basic three electrode cell um, you're probably going to hear me say three electrode. Uh, I don't know how many times. It's going to be too many times. Um, but the reoccurring idea here is that all of these cells essentially support a three electrode experiment. They're just designed a little bit differently to support the different uh, samples that you might be studying. Um, so in this case, our working electrode is the sample right down here. Uh, we have our counter electrode and our reference electrode, so those make up our three electrodes. Um, let's just stop it here. Let me go ahead and pull this apart so you can get a better idea of how this is designed. So this is just an open end cylinder, opened on both sides. And the reason for that is that we can expose just this one little spot right here on the coated sample. This is one of our sample masks. Uh, the reason that I have this on here is so you can avoid edge effects around um, where this o-ring makes contact here with the sample. Um, might also help you get a better idea of the actual surface area you're studying, uh, but these can be really effective if, um, if you're noticing a lot of variables, uh, variances in, in your data, uh, might be because of edge effects around the edge. So the sample mask can be used. Um, so what I did first is just kind of scratch off the edge right here to expose some of the substrate. If, if you're testing on coated samples like this, make sure you get the exposed metallic substrate. Don't try to connect your cables to the coating. Um, you're gonna see that your data is not gonna be very good if you do that. But we just have our base here. I'm gonna set the coated sample right there. O-ring sits on top, like so. And you can see our exposed area of the coated sample down below there. And so right there, that, that's our working electrode that we're looking at down on the bottom and the base of our cell at the same time. 
So we have this clamp to create that seal on the bottom of it here. So the clamp's gonna just kind of fit on like this. Screw it down to apply some pressure. And now we should see seal down the bottom. I should be able to pour electrolyte into the top of this um, and have it sealed well for us. So there's our working electrode, as I said before. And I just have this little stopper here that has the reference electrode. I can put a little bit closer if you'd like to see. This is our calomel reference electrode and a graphite rod as the counter electrode. So we can fill up the volume here to anywhere from about 20 to uh, maybe 50 milliliters of solution. I uh, just wanna make sure you have enough in there that you contact both uh, uh, the tip of the reference electrode and, and immerse also the counter electrode. It'll fit in like so. And there's your simple three electrode cell for a flat specimen, coated specimen, something like that. Um, move this out of the way. I'll go ahead and show you how we would connect our cables to this. Um, there shouldn't be much difference if you have a different potentiostat, but there's probably a little bit of variation, so make sure you do double check um, before you run these experiments. So for our cells, we have a... Actually, let me, let me take a second and talk about our cables so you'll be able to follow along. Um, with every potentiostat, we give out this wonderful little mouse pad. And what it shows is the color codes for our cables. Uh, green is working, the current carrier, uh, on, on, on your working electrode. The blue is the working sense, the sense cable on your working electrode. White is your reference electrode. And the red is the counter electrode, uh, the uh, current carrier for your counter electrode. Uh, for now, we're gonna ignore what the orange and the black are. Um, I'll touch base back on those here in just a bit. Uh, so for our working electrode, like I said, we wanna connect the green and the blue cable. So both of those, I'm just going to attach here on the base where I scraped off some of the coating and I have that metallic uh, surface exposed right there. So that's my connection for my working electrode. I have my reference electrode lead that I'm gonna connect here to the white. I have my counter electrode red, I'm gonna connect here. And one thing I wasn't able to get into my secret lab here, otherwise known as my garage, is the Faraday cage that you likely might wanna use um, with this cell and with coated samples. So that Faraday cage, well, first I should say that with these coated samples, you're probably measuring very small signals. Um, that's also why I connected the Gamry Reference 600 Plus. That's what it's designed for. Um, extremely low currents, I think it's low current range is 60 picoamps and can measure impedances to terahms and very low uh, pore capacitors and the single picofarad uh, capacitors. So uh, essentially everything you're coating is, um, is what, we use this unit for. So I'd have this inside of a Faraday cage. And the one cable I didn't mention was the black pin right here. Uh, just to help uh, the accuracy of your measurements, uh, reduce noise and the quality of, of your data, um, you might wanna plug this into uh, maybe some of the uh, exposed metallic area of the Faraday cage. Um, so you can kind of use your imagination. We have this all enclosed inside of a Faraday cage and we have this connected uh, to, to an exposed metallic surface, uh, and you'd be up and ready to run your experiments with uh, the flat uh, with a uh, paint test cell. Um, so the kind of applications you'd use for this, of course, would be coated samples. Uh, with a coated sample, you could have this uh, uh, set up running probably for uh, days, weeks, months, and and collect good data. Um, if you wanted to use uh, a more corrosive surface, bare steel, something like that, that's certainly gonna corrode uh, very quickly, um, or relatively quickly, I should say, then this cell would be very good for, for a single experiment, running something like uh, linear polarization resistance, or you're doing a potential dynamic scan, um, EIS, impedance um, spectroscopy, you could, you could run those experiments and this cell would work very well for that. If you're going to do very long-term exposure um, experiments on something that's corrosive, something that's gonna create a lot of uh, corrosion products within this cell, start changing the concentration and the composition of the electrolyte, then this probably wouldn't be a very good cell for that. Um, but for a coated sample, you can run long-term experiments uh, for, for something that's gonna be highly corrosive. It's still good for, 
for short-term experiments, uh, but, but not for long-term. We'd, we'd go for a different cell for something like that. Um, this is all also a relatively inexpensive cell. So if you need to run mini cells uh, at the same time, then this could be a very good cell to go with because it's going to keep your cost down. Um, so if there isn't any specific questions on the paint test cell, I'll probably go ahead and move along to the next one. Um, but Andrew, can I jump in quick? Yeah. I yeah. did have a question about sample size okay. uh, from EJ. It's what happens if we have a much smaller sample uh, than what you're showing, say a five by five, uh, five millimeter by five millimeter sample? Can that be used here or is there something else? Uh, there's a couple different solutions for that. If, if we're still talking about just this cell, then um, no, your sample's not going to work without you doing some kind of sample prep to um, possibly embed this uh, in, into some kind of non-conductive medium that will, you, know, you, you could embed it into a piece of epoxy or something like that and make electrical connection. You, you could do that, it'd be pretty cumbersome, um, but there are other cells that would support uh, a sample size of, of that geometry. When, when I get ahead to the multi-port corrosion cell kit, you can actually see it here in the background. Um, I'll go ahead and pull it forward now just for a moment. If you look just inside here, I have the flat specimen holder. Um, the bridge tube is kind of blocking it, but let's see if I can scoot that over a bit. Uh, that's going to be much closer to supporting what you're doing. Um, you don't have to do any kind of uh, uh, sample prep, as I mentioned before. Five millimeters by five millimeters, that still might be a little too small for this, but I think uh, with a sample mask, we could probably make that work. Let me think here for a second. That's, that's going to be close. Um, but this might be a better route going with the flat specimen holder uh, to handle a sample of that size. And uh, I guess I'll go ahead and move on to the next cell, if that helps answer your question. Let me construct this one really quick. Another option for that last question would also be this paracel. Um, a little bit more going on. As, as I go with each cell, they're, they're kind of going to get more complicated visually, I guess. But at the end of the day, it's still just a three electrode um, setup that we're looking at. In this case, we can also do uh, uh, four electrode. Um, let me unconnect these cables really quick. So. So this also supports, the Paracel kit here also supports flat specimens. And the two specimens are mounted on either side, right here, I guess you can't see the, you can just see that green right there. And of course, I think this orange is picking up pretty well. Um, so we can mount specimens on either side. And I'll show you that in just one second. Get my cables ready. Um, so the way this works is we squeeze a flat specimen against the wall here on either side. And I'm going to go ahead and pull off the counter electrode graphite block here. So this right here is what connects to the actual sample. Our, pin, our, our cables are going to connect right here respectively on either side. Uh, and we put this graphite block, this is what comes with it as your counter electrode. Um, that'll lay against the metal here, and then this is going to be pressed up against this up. See this little hole that I have right here, and, and I have uh, this O-ring right here. Um, it's a PTFE uh, a silicon O-ring, and the exposed area of that is getting much smaller than we were with the PTC. Uh, still wouldn't support that 5x5 five five, um, uh, geometry, but by use of those sample masks that I mentioned before, I think you could probably get away with using that uh, uh, with a cell like this too. Um, so the, you, you would place a sample mask over this surface. Imagining this was much smaller than the exposed area. You could put it over this surface, but since you have this metal here, um, I, I think you'd be able to get enough pressure to still create a seal uh, that, that could support a smaller uh, sample size as mentioned. Uh, but the exposed area 
on, on this guy is about uh, two and a half, 2.6 centimeters squared. And again, you can use a sample mask on this as well. And I'll show you on the other side in a second. So just have this little screw. Oh, I dropped the block. So I use the pressure of these threads to push the block against and create a seal against uh, uh, the polycarbonate um, cell body right here. And the reason that we have the polycarbonate cell body is if you're using high alkali media, um, long-term exposure on glass could start to damage the glass. So here's just a piece of uh, metal that I have. Also put the sample mask on this. You can see there's, there's where the O-ring made contact and then I have the exposed area right here on the surface. Um, so you have this parallel plate configuration. You can take uh, samples as, as thin as what I'm using now, probably a little bit thinner. You can also go out to a sample that's probably about um, just, just under two centimeters in thickness. I'd, I'd say it's really close to about three quarters of an inch is about as thick as you can make it when you unscrew and back up this piece right here. Um, let me go ahead and put this back on. I just want to make sure everybody saw how we made connection to the cells with this. So that's where we'd have our two electrodes, our working and our counter electrodes. Um, you could switch them the other way around, really doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, at the top here, I have our reference electrode. Hey, Andrew, uh, can we pause for a moment? Yeah. Yes, we have a question from uh, Neil. Okay. Okay, Neil. Hey, uh, how important is it to have the counter electrode uh, have a larger surface area than the working electrode? Because I, I know that's the, I know it's important in other setups, and this it seems like the the holes on either side are the same size. Yes. So generally, you want to have a larger counter electrode uh, than the working electrode. But the reason for that, um, for, for the larger size, is you don't want your counter electrode to be limiting the current that could be flowing to the working electrode. So that's that's the idea of having a larger surface area. I'll also add that your counter electrode, you want uh, to make sure there aren't any reactions taking place on the counter electrode that's gonna affect um, your measurements. So those are kind of the two criteria. Um, depending on the kind of experiment you're running, uh, yes, you might need a larger surface area. For these corrosion experiments, generally the currents are, are low enough that excuse me, you're not going to run into much of a situation like that. But you'll see when we get to the next couple cells, the counter electrode is going to have a much larger surface area uh, than the working. But in, in the case of the paracel here, um, the, the surface area is the same. And it's designed that way for a specific reason. Um, when I get into the applications, we can start talking about looking at a galvanic couple, um, doing ZRA experiments. So for this cell, it's, it's actually designed that way to to have the surface areas as close as possible uh, to one another. Um, but again, depending on your specific experiment, having that larger surface area on the counter electrode might be crucial. Um, on the other end, if, if you're doing the uh, galvanic couple, you would want those two surface areas to be very close to one another. Um, so, so yeah, just definitely scrutinize what you're actually trying to do um, to see if, if, if that's something you need to pay close attention to. All right. Thank you. Yep. Andrew, I have another question. Uh, okay. that, since we keep talking about this tape, can you? Uh, what is this tape made out of, or what? It, what kind of tape is it? And are there any issues with liquid getting underneath uh, the edges? Um. Yeah. So, uh, why am I blinking on the um, material for the tape? It's platers tape, electroplating tape. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I forget the, the, the exact name on, on um, the tape, but uh, we, we, we can give you that. It's, it's, it's just uh, the, the material. It's, it's chemically resistant. I'll, I'll definitely uh, tell you that. But in terms of getting, let me see, let me grab the paint test cell again. I mean, I'm sorry, the, yeah, paint test cell. So, okay, I wish I had another piece, but what I'll do is try to pull this off a little bit. So you can see I'm kind of pulling this tape off. 
right here. I'm not going to pull it off all the way, but now I'm, let's imagine I'm applying it for the first time. And I didn't do a very good job right there. Notice that I have all these little bubbles. Can you see the bubble? Yeah, you can definitely see it if I turn it this way. So these, these are accentuated. This would be a very sloppy job. Um, but you can see, yeah, there's a clear path that liquid could, could leak along here and, and get down. So when applying the tape, pressure, you want to use pressure. See, I'm taking my thumb and I might even be able to pull it off the way I put this on. But visually, I don't, I'm not sure if you guys can pick it up, but you can see little spots right here where it's still not completely compressed to get the sample. So you just wanna use your thumb and make sure you create a good seal. If, if, if you pay attention and make sure there's not little uh, lighter spots where the tape is lifted, then you will create a good seal. Um, but if you don't do that, yes, I say it's very possible you could leak underneath of the tape. Um, but generally speaking, I, I have not seen any problem with that because I'll take the time to make sure I get right around here and make sure this is pressed down very, very well um, and tight. So that's something to just uh, take care of. Which generally overall, with, with these experiments, the sample prep, the setup of everything is very, very crucial. Um, you might be scratching your head as to why your experiment didn't work. Take a very close look at how you set everything up. Look and see if maybe some liquid leaked underneath here. If so, I mean, spend a little more time making sure that you, you uh, um, press down on this and, and secure it. So, so overall, scrutinize your sample prep and how your setup is and, and make sure that you're not running into situations like that, which are just going to slow down your experiment and make you have to start over again. But yeah, with the sample tape or uh, the, the electrochemical masks, um, yeah, I, I've not seen any issues with the leaking beneath the mask as long as you take the time and make sure you create a good seal on the surface. I guess I will add the sizes available for that are, uh, uh, they're, they're already pre-cut out. It's one centimeter squared, uh, uh, three centimeter squared, and 10 centimeter squared. Um, so you can get three different sizes uh, for those. Um, back to the paracel kit here. Um, talked about the working electrode, counter electrode. Uh, still can do three electrodes. Here is the bridge tube and the reference electrode. Let me pull out the reference electrode. This is just the bridge tube. Um, these are very useful for electrochemical measurements. What it allows is that the porous glass frit right here, you get very, very close. Let's see, let's make sure you can see it. Can everybody see that little red ring just behind where my finger is when I move it? It's going to be right behind there. See that little red yeah. ring right there? That's the surface of the sample. We can see it. Yep. So what I'm going to do is put this down. Let me turn a little bit more. And it's actually a little bit deep. But you, I would raise this up a little bit. And now my reference, my, my blue sense cable, what I'm measuring, the difference between my working electrode and, and my reference is being measured from that point as opposed to further away. Um, and, and basically what, you, what you're dealing with that is, is you're eliminating or reducing the effects of uh, IR drop. Um, you're also having a consistent geometry with your cell. So every time you make measurements, your reference electrode isn't at a different point. It'll always be uh, sampling from the same point. And for a moment, let's just talk about these <clears throat> porous glass fritz right here. So this is actually, uh, uh, Teflon shrink wrap that's holding this little frit on the end. So I could just take a razor blade, cut this off, and it, it would be uh, essentially just a lugging capillary at that point. Um, but you can replace these little uh, frits on the end. Let's see how well you can see it. You should see the color changes just a bit. Maybe if I shade this, you can see a little bit better. Oh, there you go. You should be able to see the where it tapers off. Uh, so we can replace these. These things do fail over time if they're allowed to dry out. Um, or they become uh, blocked, it's a, it's a porous glass, so you could block the path there, uh, then you might need to change this, this little guy out, and you definitely can do that. And that also goes for the reference electrodes too. Those work the same way. Um, if you ever get one of our reference electrodes, make sure you pull off the black cap before you run any experiments. Sounds simple enough, but some people leave this on, then they call us up wondering what's going on. And, Simple fix, but you overlook something. So let's see, this will be a good example. Uh, can you see all the dried crystals? 
inside of this reference electrode. Sorry if it's bouncing around. I'm trying to hold it still, but yeah, right here we can see some dried crystals. Uh, this reference electrode is completely dried out. Um, we need to put more solution in it. We need to replace the glass frit right here on the end. Um, so you certainly can do that. This, this one might just be too far gone, but um, still, it, it gives the idea that you can always put fresh solution inside of these and replace the glass frit. So don't throw away your reference electrodes as soon as you run to an issue. See if you can bring it back. Good reference electrodes are not cheap. So it's worth taking a little bit of time to see if you can uh, maintain and, and bring it back to the point it needs to be at. Um, so we have our three electrodes set up and I'm gonna connect the 600 plus again to the paracel here. So it's color coordinated for our cables. You have a green, let me do it this way. You have blue and green right here. So here's your current carrier. Here's your blue sense cable for your working electrode. On the other end here, I have my red and then the orange. I'll, I'll mention this orange here in a second, but I'll go ahead and connect to it. And then the reference. So I'll connect my sense cables first. This is the orange. I'm gonna go ahead and connect it this time. And then I have my blue sense cable. And now I'm gonna connect my current carriers. There's my red the red pin, to the blue into the green. Still have this black, you can use this as a grounding point again if you need to. Uh, and there I have my three electrodes set up, uh, ready to go for you. Um, so a couple things about the Paracel. This is gonna hold a larger volume than the last cell that we looked at. This is about 200 to 400 milliliters uh, that you can work with this. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The cell body is made of polycarbonate, so if you're doing high alkali media, you might want to go with a cell like this so you don't damage the glass. Um, it has the PTFE uh, uh, encapsulated O-rings on either side, uh, so again, that, that'll be chemically resistant, also for high alkali media. Um, and the kind of experiments you're looking at this, uh, electrochemical noise, you could do corrosions of materials, you could do longer uh, uh, experiments with this. Um, Another one that you can use with this is looking at galvanic corrosion, looking at a galvanic couple. And that goes back to that previous question on uh, the surface area. So if you have the same surface area on both sides and you have the same material as you're working in your counter, uh, then you can do uh, that, that galvanic corrosion experiment. And what you need to do that is a ZRA setup, zero resistance amp meter. And that's where that orange cable came in. You remember I showed you this a little bit earlier and you have the counter sense. That's, that's where that cable comes in. Um, that's one of the few experiments that actually incorporates um, that orange cable. Uh, so that's why that pin is, is on the paracel and that's why it's connected up right now. Uh, so this cell again can run all the same experiments we just looked at to the paint test cell. You can also do uh, galvanic corrosion, has a larger volume, so you can do longer term experiments with it. Uh, on, on a corrosive material, um, it can support higher alkali uh, uh, media uh, for your electrolyte. A um, couple extra ports here on the top. Uh, let me back it up so I can I have the cables connect. So you see a couple extra ports here on the top. You can see one here. I have the number seven ace thread um, uh, uh, blocking that right there. So if you need to seal it up, you can do it. If you need to put uh, temperature sensing, um, if you need to bubble a gas in there, blanket something on the surface, you could always introduce something like that on there. So, so like I said, each, each one of the cells as we go through gets a, maybe a little more uh, complicated, um, adds more flexibility and capabilities of what you can run. But um, uh, at the end of the day, we're still just running a three electrode experiment. And um, yeah, all, all of our cells are still going to do that, still running three electrode experiments. Um, so if we don't have any other questions specific to the Paracel kit, I can go ahead and move on to the next cell I wanted to look at. Uh, but if you do have questions, um, go ahead. We can address them. I can always bring the cell back over. No big deal. Uh, let's see. But those, those two cells that I had there, um, 
really are dealt with corrosion experiments primarily. They don't necessarily have to just be corrosion experiments, but that was what they were designed for initially. Um, so those, those are corrosion related. Another one of the cells still gonna be corrosion related. That's the big cell back here, but we'll, we'll get to that one last. Um, I'm gonna kind of switch gears to one of our smaller cells here. And this is the Dr. Bob cell kit. The Dr. Bob cell here is what I used, um, I think almost exclusively uh, in graduate school. Uh, this, this little guy right here with all this stuff coming out of the top of it. Um, this comes in an unjacketed version as you see here and, and you have to have a, a, a holder in order because it's not gonna stand up by itself, but you can also get a jack jacketed version. In the next cell, I'll show you the jacketed version um, and, and, and how that would work. Uh, but the Dr. Bob cell here, put this down a little lower. Again, just simple three electrode experiments performed in here, um, supports much lower volumes. So as low as one milliliter, um, you go up as high as 30 milliliters. And if, if you're just uh, uh, doing what I'll call simple electrochemical experiments, you're, you're, you're running CVs, you're looking at specific redox couples, uh, even doing simple kinetic studies, um, or anything that requires very low volume. Your, your electrolyte, the materials you're using, they cost a lot of money. You want to reduce the volume, reduce the cost, reduce the waste. Uh, this is a very good cell for that. Um, has five different ports. Three of the ports uh, are number seven ACE thread. Um, and that essentially supports something from about maybe six and a half to seven and a half millimeters in diameter. Uh, the electrodes, the, the different apparatus you might put in there. Um, the other two ports are 1420 ports. Where I had those other two guys. We'll talk about each one of those. So here's the cell, alone all by itself. And we'll start with the working electrode. This is one of our working electrodes that the, the length of design of it really goes well along with the Dr. Bob cell. Uh, this is one of the platinum working electrodes. We have the uh, 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 seven millimeter platinum disc uh, uh, here on the on the end. We also have micro electrodes, but I'll show you that uh, uh, on the next cell. Uh, so this we can support right down the middle. Uh, since all three of the number seven ace threads are the same, if you need to have this at an angle, you could put it on the side. Maybe you have bubbles generating on your working electrode. You want it angled so those will roll off and not congregate. Well, you can configure that out however you like. There's our working electrode right down the middle here. Um, my counter electrode included with the Dr. Bob cell is a platinum wire to use as a counter electrode. Um, you also get a counter electrode isolation tube here. It has frit uh, uh, the fritted glass here on the tip. That's I'll put down here and you can slide your wire right inside of there. Um, actually, one, one other thing I wanted to kind of talk about before I put the, um, the reference electrode bridge tube in is there's these little O-rings that we have attached. And I think by default, most people like to take these O-rings and slide them on prior to putting this fitting on because the O-ring kind of just sits on top of the fitting and, and it would look like that would, um, it just kind of makes sense that, that that might be how you put it on there because it sits nicely. It's actually designed to go the other way. You take your fitting and we want to put that on first like this and then you slide this O-ring to whatever height you're looking for because down in the bottom of the cell here. I don't know how well you can see, but it tapers in a bit and that O-ring is gonna lay against the uh, surface of the glass. Now, what's the point of doing that? Well, it seals the cell. So if you're creating uh, any kind of gas product, it's not gonna escape. If you need to blanket it with an inert gas, you know, uh, the, uh, the gas in the lab isn't going to invade into the cell and, and 
and do anything like that. So, so another just helpful tip, make sure that the uh, uh, O-ring is placed on the inside prior to sliding this guy on. So it would be like, like such, where this sits in place. And it's not gonna let it slide down because that O-ring's sitting down there on the base. So use this O-ring, sorry, use this O-ring above, uh, I'm sorry, have the fitting above the O-ring, slide it in so it seats itself, screw this in, it adds a little bit of pressure, creates a seal. So keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, so here's the reference electrode bridge tube, which we discussed why we'd use one of those before. Um, right here, it's, this, this is the one time you actually have a larger fitting up at the top. This is a number 11 fitting, and that's to support uh, the reference electrode and, and the size of this uh, cavity right here. So you would fill your same working electrode solution, uh, your working solution inside of this bridge tube. So whatever you're putting inside the cell, generally you're gonna put the same solution inside of here and then immerse at least the tip of your reference electrode. Don't forget to take off the black cap. This is one of our silver, silver chloride reference electrodes. Uh, the other two 1420 uh, um, ports that we have here, one is to support this gas bubbler right here. So let me bring this down a little bit lower. So this guy right here, you can introduce a gas through this port. It's going to bubble through and then come out the other end. Uh, this is open space right here. I can show you by unscrewing this. So there's open space in there. And that will allow you, one, to degas off of there. If you're building up pressure, you do have the ability to let gas uh, come through here, but you can also, also sample from that. Maybe, maybe you'll hook up a hose, just direct it right to a GCMS or something like that to, to see what kind of products you're making in the top. Um, so depending on the height of this, you can either introduce gas directly into your working solution, or you could bring it up higher and blanket the surface uh, of the solution if need be. And then the other port on the other side right here, uh, you could simply just cap it off like such if you don't need to add anything else, but maybe you want to do some temperature sensing at the same time. Um, you have an RTD probe or, or any number of different thermocouples and, and anything you want, but I just had a thermometer handy right here. So that, um, it's a little bit too long. So you can introduce that or any a number of, of other um, apparatus you might want to insert into the cell there. Um, so that's, that's the Dr. Bob cell. Um, any specific questions on the Bob cell or any of the apparatus in here? I, I will mention when I said that you could go down to very low uh, volumes, if you, if you look closely, um, you know, when we're talking about a milliliter, right down here, it's, there's not gonna be very much volume of, of solution or, or the level's gonna be very low. So there's a good chance that you won't be able to use the counter electrode isolation tube. You're probably just gonna have to stick the wire uh, in and, and, and get it secured. Um, same thing with the working electrode. That, that surface area might be a little bit big. So just, just keep that in mind that while the vessel will support low volumes, you might have to adapt a little bit in order to get your electrodes immersed in there properly. Always be able to adapt with these experiments. Oops. But yeah, this, this would be our very low volume cell. So um, doing any novel synthesis where you have very expensive reagents, this is probably the kind of cell you wanna look at. Um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't recommend doing anything like that with a screen printer electrode because the quality is just not there uh, for the cell. The, the volume is very good for those, but, but if uh, you're using expensive electrolyte, make sure you get a quality cell to do those small volumes. Um, you'll be selling yourself short and scratching your head as to why things aren't working properly. Uh, the next cell is basically the Dr. Bob with a larger volume. You could think of, at least initially. Um, this is the Euro cell. 
and it's the jacketed version of the Eurocell. So there's two barbs on either side right here. So you can introduce a, 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 a fluid to control the temperature within the cell. And let me get it close enough. You can see the cell within uh, the jacketed body. Um, so the outside jacketed solution is isolated from anything within the cell. You don't need a stand with this because the jacket, uh, the jacket also works as a stand. And this cell can be used for several different uh, uh, applications. Um, it can handle a larger volume, so 50 to probably 200 milliliters, um, maybe more like 150 milliliters uh, for this cell. So you can work with larger volumes. Um, it also can be designed to work with rotator experiments. I don't have any rotator apparatus or electrodes or anything, um, but, it, but if you're doing something like that, we do have either this cell or a specific cell based off this used for rotation experiments. Um, this working electrode fitting right here, it's a 2440 uh, fitting. And what I have is one of our mild steel samples right here on the ends. Let's see if I can get that unscrewed. hard to hold on to. I'm not going to try to unscrew that thing right now. Um, but this little sample, our working electrode, that comes off and you can put any number of other threaded samples. So this, this sample is actually tapped and we're screwing into it uh, to make the electrical connection and keep everything else isolated. Notice this, this glass and all these O-rings, this keeps everything isolated except for just your working electrode. Um, and, and I know there's quite a few researchers out there that have to design their own working electrodes. Make sure you isolate just your working surface from everything else. Um, there's many ways to do that, but you gotta make sure you get it right. So if, if the wire connecting your cables up here also is exposed to your solution down there, maybe all the reactions happening on that wire and, and not on your working electrode. So definitely, make sure you isolate just your working surface. Um, just another helpful tip. But these little tapped pieces, um, it's, it's a standardized cell. Uh, uh, the, the size of this is a 3-48 UNC thread. And if you, you can get, uh, I think Metal Samples is a company that provides um, um, these cylinders for doing testing. You can go ahead and tap your own sample and, and work with something like this too. So. If, if you have something with a slightly different geometry, um, just make sure it fits through the top of this fitting at the top, the 2440 where it tapers down. If that's an issue, the next cell will take care of that if, if you can't get it down to the cell. Uh, but that's your working electrode. This is one port you could use for your working electrode. Again, the same bubbler pretty much that you saw for the Dr. Bob cell, we have one right here. Um, basically the exact same design, you can sample uh, from the headspace on this guy or, or degas from it. You can introduce gas through here, uh, either to blanket or, or if you need to bubble into the solution, either one you can do. And these are 1420 fittings, just like on the Dr. Bob cell. Here on the other side is another 1420. Uh, with the Euro cell, what's included is a graphite rod, counter electrode. Again, notice the O-rings on the bottom and this lays on top of it. So you create a seal within the cell, not the other way around. We have our bridge tube for this guy. This guy actually has a curved uh, bridge tube at the end. You can see that this has that curved surface. You can see the glass frit on the end that can be replaced if necessary. Removable reference electrode. Um, so when, it, when I put this reference electrode in here, I want to make sure that the surface is very close to my working electrode as we discussed before. So. I have it angled as such right now. Let's see if you can see in there. So it's sampling close to the surface. I, I don't know how easy it is for you to see, but if, if you look closely, you should be able to see that that is angled in and facing the uh, metallic cylinder you see in the center. Um, if you wanna use one of our working electrodes that I mentioned before with the Dr. Bob cell, you can do that. It doesn't work very good going into this central port because it's, it's just too far of a path. It doesn't get deep enough. The working electrode doesn't. But what we can do is we can cap off 
the top right here. I'm going to pull this cap on the side. I'm going to remove this counter, excuse me, this counter electrode. And this right here is one of our microelectrodes. I believe this is the glassy carbon one. Again, we can do this in uh, gold, platinum, or, or, or glassy carbon. On the tip there, um, what, beneath the glass is a 10 micron diameter uh, surface. So that's your microelectrode surface. Um, I'm going to fit this into the number seven ACE thread. All of these screwed ports are number seven ACE thread. There's, there's two of them right here that the bridge tube is in and, and that I'm going to put this guy. So by using this second port, I can get the working electrode well down into the uh, medium and also have it secure because it really wants to sit in a number ace, number seven ace thread fitting, not, not this 1420. And then uh, I'm going to use this other 1420 fitting right here and put in my counter electrode, another graphite rod. Um, so I just used an adapter that I grabbed earlier this morning um, that takes a number seven ace thread and goes to a 1420. Um, it's, it's the same adapter that you see right over here, but the second one that I had, I have another one floating around here. Um, oh, where is it? Here it is. This, this is the fitting that, that you would want that wouldn't have that sampling headspace right there. This would fit in. But there was only one I could get my hands on in the lab, so I hooked it up to this thermometer. But you could see how those two fittings would work. Uh, all these fittings are made by ACE, so you can call us up, we can provide you with this, but uh, ACE, ACE uh, uh, Glass knows our threads and, and, and our, our fittings and our cells, so you can always call them up too if you need to customize your glass to, to adapt to fit your needs. Um, okay, so I didn't do anything with the reference electrode. It's still sitting back here, nice and snug in the number seven ACE port. I moved my working electrode to one of the number sevens, and I just scooted over my counter electrode here uh, uh, to one of the 1420 fittings with, with use, of, use of an adapter. I just capped off the center port. I don't, I don't need that for anything right now. Um, and I'm still able to run my three electrode experiments uh, right here um, with the smaller port. Uh, the reference electrode and bridge tube, I'm going to rotate this a little bit. So now again, it's very close. Let's see, where's a good angle of this? Now it's very close to the surface of the microelectrode. It almost looks like it's touching, but it's not. Um, again, use for that is mainly to reduce the IR drop. I could hear somebody in the background. Did somebody have a question or anything? Um, gonna go ahead and connect this cell. I don't think I connected the Dr. Bob, but it's fine. It, it would be very similar to this one. Um, I'm gonna connect this cell to one of the interface 1010s I have. I have three of them stacked up right here. And I'm gonna go ahead and connect to one of those. Um, the 1010 or its predecessor, the 1000, again, is, is what I primarily used for all my experiments in grad school. Um, it's a very robust piece of equipment, in, unless you're doing extremely high or low impedance systems, it's probably gonna get the job done for you. Um, there's a couple other uh, uh, techniques that you might need a little bit more power or flexibility, but generally speaking, uh, the, the Interface 1010 will cover just about all the experiments you could think to run in your lab. Uh, certainly did everything I needed it to do. So again, the green and the blue here, I'm gonna connect to the working electrode. I'm gonna, there's, there's a short pin here for the working electrode. So first I'm gonna connect my current carrier, the green, onto it. Let me bring everything a little bit closer. And then I'm gonna attack the blue cable. Let's see if I can rotate this. So, oh, make sure you guys can see this. So this I have connected directly to the working electrode. This guy I'm gonna just daisy chain onto the back of the current carrier as such. You're allowed to do that. Um, but generally speaking, you wanna connect your current carrier directly to your working electrode. Your sense cable, go ahead and connect that um, uh, onto the end of the uh, current carrier cable. 
So I have my red counter electrode, connect that to the post here. And then I have my reference electrode wire, I connect that to the white. And again, my simple three electrode setup. Um, this is with the Eurocell. Um, the connection will be the exact same for the uh, Dr. Bob cell, just, just a little bit smaller, but the connections would not change one bit. You would connect this to the platinum wire instead of the graphite rod. Um, so hopefully you see some redundancy here. At the end of the day, you're, you're always connecting things the same way. You have your green and your blue connecting to your working, you have your red connected to the counter, and then you have your uh, 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 white connecting to your reference electrode. It's just different geometries and designs of cells. But at the end of the day, it's, it's still all the same. Um, I guess I can even stop for a second and say, you can do two electrode experiments with these cells uh, uh, pretty easily as well. Let me get a cable for the white one here. So if you're running two electrode experiment instead, or maybe you're not sure about your performance of your reference electrode, one, one of the things you can do is switch to two electrodes and see if, uh, if that starts cleaning up the data a little bit. All you do, instead of attaching the white reference to the reference electrode, you just attach it to your counter electrode. And you might even technically switch the two that way, I guess, um, having the white inside of, of the counter. But this would just change from having a three electrode experiment to a two electrode experiment, where you have uh, your, your white sense and your counter connected to the counter electrode, and then you have your uh, blue sense cable and your green working to the working electrode connected here. So it just went from three electrodes to two electrodes. It's just that simple. Just you change one connection. And if that covers the Euro cell here, I'll go ahead and move to the, the big cell. Let's see. So let me rearrange things a little bit because this cell is very tall and you can see everything here. So this in its entirety here is the multi-port corrosion cell kit. Um, just gonna have to keep on panning if you wanna see the, the full construction of it. But uh, this, this essentially uh, supports anywhere from 400 to a liter uh, of solution, a little bit over a liter. You probably get 1200 milliliters um, into this cell. And this cell was designed based on meeting ASTM standardized testing. I think specifically G5, the, the protocol for that. Um, if you do any ASTM standardized testing, you have to uh, follow their protocol in order for it to be valid data you're collecting. And one of the things they say is you have to have a very large volume. I think a liter minimum. Um, reason for that, again, is if you're doing a long-term exposure to a corroded material, you're gonna minimize the effects of those uh, uh, products from, from that reaction. Um, so uh, by increasing the volume, then whatever concentration changes you make uh, are, are gonna be minimal compared to something like the paint test cell we showed before, which uh, has a much smaller volume. But so again, it's a simple three electrode setup. At the top here, I have my bridge tube. This is actually connected to this ball joint at the top right here. It's an SJ2815 ball joint. Um, you get this little adapter that again fits to a number seven ace thread. And you can see this is much large, uh, longer and larger than the other bridge tubes it's so it can get down into the vessel. Um, but still at the end of the day, it's, it's the same bridge tube we've looked at before, just a little bit longer um, to support the size of the vessel. Reference lecture always fits in the same way. So having this ball joint, you can make a little bit of movement and, and rearrange this a little bit uh, to, to help angle it as necessary. And I'm going to have to refit this again. So you can see I have it set up now such that I can get very, oh, no, you can't see that. I have it set up now so you can get very close to the surface of uh, my working electrode, which you can see right there in the center. Let me pull it up. So it would be 
set up in such a way like that. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this out so we can see into the cell a little bit better. Um, just wanna mention that there's extra ports here on the top, number seven ace thread right here for uh, a graphite counter electrode that's included. You have two more number seven ace threads here, and then you have uh, two 2440 ports right up here on the top. So right now I have a graphite rod counter electrode uh, in place here. Some of the ASDM standardized uh, uh, experiments require you to have two, excuse me, to have two counter electrodes. So that's the purpose of, of another one of these guys right here. So let me unscrew the top of this. And simply can just take another graphite rod and go down into the cell. Um, the reason that they call for two graphite rods is, is, is for the flow of the current, make sure it's uh, um, flowing equally on either side. It's, if, if you read through the standard, they'll, they'll explain the reasons for that. Um, previously, there was a question about uh, counter electrode size versus working electrode size. So you can see here that the counter electrode, you have two of them, they're much larger than the working electrode. So this would be a cell designed to ensure that your counter electrode surface area is much larger and, and not limiting your current. Let me pull this guy back out. Um, so the working electrode you see down there, that is our flat specimen holder. It's an accessory that you can purchase along with the multi-port corrosion cell kit. Uh, show you something here is that if I try to take this thing out the top, I'm just banging against the top of the cell. It, it doesn't fit. And I'm sure you've noticed this metallic collar heel. The purpose of this, you can take off this collar and I can just lift up the top half of the cell like so. Um, that supports larger geometry samples. Uh, as you can see with the whole uh, um, uh, flat specimen holder, it's, it's much larger than the 2440 fitting here at the top. Um, so you can get a larger uh, sample mounted uh, here in the cell, and then you just put the top back on, put the collar back on, Lock it in place, it seals, it has the PTFE uh, uh, encapsulated O-rings, so you won't have any leaks coming from the top um, of this cell here. Uh, and yeah, that, that's gonna allow you to, to handle uh, sample geometries and, and, and samples that are much larger than will fit through the top of the ports right here. Um, also has the same bubbler with this guy, so you can bubble or blanket through this port, you can sample or degas from this port right here. And I think that basically covers most of uh, this cell. Uh, I guess I can show you what normally comes with this cell here. <laughs> I have to take off this cap. So what you would do is Like that, and now I have the flat specimen holder out. Um, there's your sample right there in the center, and you would simply unscrew this guy. There's another threaded piece right. Actually, I have a screwdriver. This guy, you're gonna unscrew. So, the idea of the flat specimen holder is fairly simplistic. You just um, you know stick this thing down in there and, and expose just a small surface area. But the devil's kind of in the details and how you're actually connecting uh, to that surface. So I'm going to unscrew this. Uh, I didn't do anything. Um, and let's see what kind of a mess we make in here. So if you see inside there, there's there's all those different rings right there. Or, or the different holes within the ring. Each one of those supports, and I don't know how well you can see these, but they're these tiny, I'm just gonna hold them in my hand and try not to lose them. Can we see, see those tiny gold pins? Each one of those sit within one of the holes inside the ring. 
and all those are making contact with the, the outside of your sample. In this case, it was just a piece of aluminum that I took off a can. Um, so that was sitting there and make contact. And you can rest assured that you're making good contact with your sample. It's isolated properly. So the flat specimen holder can make life very easy with um, using tougher uh, samples. Much like the five by five millimeter sample that, that was asked earlier, that would probably work very well in there. Um, what usually comes with this guy is, it should look familiar. It's the same thing you saw with the Eurocell. And, and this would be the setup you have. This actually fits right down in there. And let's see, can you see that? So what are we seeing here? There's the sample, you can see it going up and down. That is standard what would be uh, uh, coming with the multi-port corrosion cell. Um, using working electrodes, like I mentioned uh, before, like uh, this, this micro electrode or, or using uh, the one I showed with the Dr. Bob cell, um, those are too short. Those aren't gonna work with a big cell like this. A guy like that, um, you just, it's its not deep enough. I mean, I, I don't even think it's gotten below this first O-ring uh, right there. So again, really think about what you're doing before uh, you start ordering some of this equipment because it might not work and you're going to have to start uh, changing things around that may or may not affect the experiment significantly. Uh, but for much larger... Uh, size samples, um, something like this work out very well. Or if you're doing ASTM standardized testing, you might be required to get a cell very much like this. So we'll have it ready to go out of the box for you. Um, but generally speaking, if you're doing any standardized testing, make sure you have a good understanding of exactly what the experimental setup is because you have to match it verbatim. So those are all the I'll call liquid electrochemical cells um, that I have. But we also have, uh, well, they, they are cells, they're holders for uh, energy devices. So for batteries, just take this battery right here, I can, um, I can figure out a way to connect to the anode and cathode right here, maybe, maybe uh, solder some tabs on there and, and, and connect my cables as such to, to the end of those tabs. But um, that that can enter in a lot of uh, variability in in one cell setup from another, um, and you know th there's already enough error involved with these measurements that in any way to reduce additional error is, is is a good idea. So we have a couple battery holder cells that take advantage of of a couple things. One is uh, the geometry will always be the same. You can use uh, the four-point Kevin measurement. All, all of our uh, energy device holders uh, support that kind of measurement, which um, for most experiments, uh, the, the impedance, the resistance of the system is high enough that you don't need that four-point connection. Um, but with energy devices, the impedance can get low enough that you do need it. You can make a significant difference in it. And, and if you're not sure what I'm talking about, I would say go look in our application notes and look in the energy devices and and I think there's a specific app note on low impedance systems and how to set up your cell for it that kind of stuff um, go, go check that out I think we even have a video uh, now on it from a previous webinar so I'm not going to go in detail over that but I will show you how we connect to those systems um, with with uh, uh, a couple of our potentia stats so for that, I'm going to use the Interface 5000, which I have on top here. Uh, below were three of the 1010s. The 1010s only go to one amp uh, for max current. The 5000 here can go all the way up to five amps. Um, I guess you could say we played with Ohm's Law a little bit, where we reduced uh, the range of uh, voltage. So the 5000 will only give you plus or minus six volts, but you can have a much higher uh, current. It also has a, a um, its low current range is only 50 microamps, but for most energy devices, that's fine. You're, you're not looking at currents much below that. Um, in comparison, that 1010 that I mentioned, that goes down to 10 nanoamps. So that, that can work for something that low currents uh, are anticipated, maybe, maybe electrochemical sensors, things of that nature. You expect low currents, so 
you'll want something that goes way below 50 microamps. But for energy devices, uh, the 5000 is, is a very good choice. Um, I'm a little bit closer. So this is one of our holders for that. You can see I have this little slide pin right here. This is our universal battery holder. The idea is that I can pull these very close. You can do a coin cell in between uh, these, or I can pull them uh, farther apart, just to support whatever size uh, the, the battery actually is. Um, if you look close, you can see there's a larger surface area, and then there's a little pin just inside of it. That's, that's your four-point measurement. So your current uh, is mainly flowing through this larger surface area, and your sense is through this little pogo pin. And we have the same thing on the other side right here. I have a little pin inside of, of that surface. Um, so depending on the size of battery, let's back this up a little bit more. Take that. Oh, not quite far back. Slide the battery in as so. You can tighten it up a little bit if you want. So that, that's all it takes to connect the battery. That's, that's all there is. You just slide it right in there. So you have the same connection every single time. Um, and then you just have to connect the cables. And if we look right here, at least if you're using our potentia stat, it's gonna tell you exactly what cable to put where, because it's all color coordinated. So working sense, put the blue one there. Reference, put the white one right here. You have uh, your, your counter sense orange, you can put it right there. Your current carriers are gonna be on this side. We even have these little screw uh, uh, a post right here if you're using something like our, our uh, uh, booster. So the booster can get you up to 30 amps. Um, you don't want to plug in and pass the 30 amps through here. We, we want to pass it on these on these pins on the top here. Uh, you have your fuse, which is going to handle <clears throat> your 35 amps. If, if for some reason you just start pushing more amps than, than the system can handle, it'll blow the fuse and, and not damage your cell or the potentiostat. Um, these can get very, very hot. So actually on the bottom, it gives you temperature limits. Um, conveniently, we, we put the values right here on the bottom, but check your cell and make sure it can handle the temperature that you're planning to apply. Also your cables, things like that. Um, you could melt this very easily if you get above 80 C, which is the value it has right there, 176 F. Connecting the cables, just like I said, you just just look at the uh, look at the colors and line them up. So counter electrode red, it's going to go right in there. Working electrode green, it's going to go on the top here, and then orange to orange, reference to reference, blue to blue. Still have the ground here. You can connect that to a floating ground if you want. Um, now now you're set up and ready to run your experiments. One thing I'll mention about the 5000 that also is really interesting. Um, this is a commercial cell, so it's going to be very hard to embed some kind of reference point within it. But if you're building your own um, uh, uh, energy device and in construction, you can design a way to put in a reference point or you're testing something like a fuel cell or a stack of batteries, the 5000 has a second electrometer built into it. So what that'll allow you to do is study both half cells at the same time. Uh, generally with, with a battery like this, you're just studying the full cell, the voltage drop, the current flowing between this, this complete cell right here. But if you can embed a reference point, say there's a membrane right there, uh, then you can put a reference here and you can study just this half of the cell this half cell, what's happening at the cathode, what's happening at the anode, um, and what's happening across the complete cell all at the same time. Um, works very good for impedance to do something like that. If you can isolate just half the cell, then your model is only gonna be half the cell and uh, modeling a smaller system is easier than having to account for all the other phenomena um, taking place. Same thing with fuel cells. It, it can make life uh, much easier. And if you're doing stacks of batteries, then you can do, oh, I had a second battery floating around here. Um, you can connect this in such a way that you have two batteries, a reference point. So you're isolating the response of this battery and this battery within the stack and also studying the stack at the exact same time. Very, very helpful. Um, also increases throughput. 
if you want to study something like that with a, a standard potentiostat, one that doesn't have extra electrometers, then you have to first study the full cell, then study just one of the batteries, then study the other battery, and hope all those times while you're making the connections that things aren't changing within the system. Um, so being able to connect to something like that uh, can, can make life a lot easier, speed up production, and also eliminate variability in your measurements. So I'm going to unconnect that one. Have another cell that's very similar, but this was to support pouch cells. I have a pouch cell right in here right now. Um, the top right here, we just unscrew these guys and then it lays against the two tabs, the anode and cathode. So you screw these down tight. There's metal plates down on the back side of the PCB that make connection to that. And then exactly the same thing you saw in the universal, universal battery holder I just showed, you have the same connections here. Um, this one I'll go ahead and hook up the reference 3000 to. That's this potential step right here. Um, this is definitely the flagship of, of our, our family of potentiostats. It can handle extremely high currents, so battery testing, things of that nature. It can also handle the same low currents that we talked about with the reference 600 plus. Um, so it basically, if you have a 3000, it's gonna be very hard to find a system you would not be able to study, especially if this is coupled with the 30K booster. Um, you can add a booster to this to get you up to 30 amps of current. Uh, so Something for, for a larger scale cell, stacks of batteries, getting up to 30 amps would be very, very useful. Um, same connections that you saw previously. You still have the red and the green, the blue, the white, the orange counter sense. I can connect it the same way right here. Something else I want to point out that you can see is you have these additional connections and additional cables. This is a single channel instrument. These are not extra channels that you see right here. What these are, are additional electrometers. So what you're able to do is just kind of go a little bit further than what I just talked about with the 5,000. With this, you can actually uh, do a full stack of batteries and uh, we can do up to eight differential voltages within a stack of batteries. So everything I just talked about with the 5,000 of taking two batteries and studying each battery individually, we can take a stack of eight batteries and simultaneously we can study uh, battery one all the way through eight individually and then the full cell all at the exact same time. Um, as far as I know, nobody else has that capability, um, particularly at the price that we provide it for. Uh, so if you're looking into stacks of batteries, things like this, this, this might be a very good system uh, to, to take a look at, especially with the auxiliary electrometer cables and just, it's, it's an extra set of cables um, and you have these purple and uh, yellow connections. So one end is just going to go on, uh, um, you, you, you kind of daisy chain them along uh, the different cells. You'll have, you'll have two points right here, two points right here, two points connected right here, and each one's just isolating the measurement between each of the batteries, and then you have the full cell connected at the end. So the 3000 there. Um, that, I think, are all the cells that I have right now. Did I miss anything? I don't think that I did. Well, there are things that I missed that I just don't have available in my garage right now. I'll have to go um, back to the lab and get more. But we do have other cells. Um, we do support quartz crystal microbalance and, and doing electrochemical experiments in there. So that is another cell that we have. Again, it's just another three electrode cell, um, but the configuration of it is, is unlike any of these other systems that you looked, like, uh, looked at here. The, the volumes are much smaller, the flow rates, um, and, and they are flow cells. The flow rates are, are fairly small, um, but yeah, we, we, we can support three electrode experiments in any number of different media and, and things like that. Um, screen print electrodes, we, we have those. I don't know if anybody uh, has ever dealt with those before, but those can be extremely inexpensive, um, complete cell setups to, to you know, run experiments on. Very good for educational purposes. Um, 
if you just need something really small, it, it can work, but the, the quality is definitely not there compared to the cells that, that I was showing earlier. Um, but they do have their niche and, and people are using them pretty readily. Um, but are there any other questions at this point? Because I can pull out the cells and we can talk about other things in detail or, um, or yeah, we can go from there. Uh, Andrew, we did, I just want to, I want to point out one thing because I had a couple of people ask me while you were talking about the cells. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned temperature sensing a couple of times and people ask what kind of temperature inputs they are. And the reference okay. instruments are K-type thermocouples if you want to turn it around. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're K-type thermocouples. Yeah. And then the interface family, the 1010 and the 5000, they are RTD inputs using a, a monitor port on the front. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is right. You have your monitor right here. Okay. And um, I guess I'll also mention, since we're talking about the potential stats a little bit, um, all of these are single channel instruments. This, this can be operated as a single channel instrument that I can take over to another computer and anywhere I want. It can be operated all by itself. But they have little notches we designed in the chassis because these, these are meant to be stacked and sit you know, quite securely in place. So now, now you have a multi-channel system um, that you can connect all of these to a single computer and, and run it that way. But one big advantage of this is look at the length of these cables. If I was to set all these cells right here um, with just these four channels, it's, it's going to create a real mess. Can you imagine working in a lab this close to somebody else? I mean, you'd be right on top of them trying to get things set up. Glass is going to break. People are going to get aggravated. Wouldn't it be nice to just take your channel way over to the other corner of the lab and do your experiments there? Maybe you have to put it in a hood. Maybe you have to connect it to another piece of equipment that's, that's much further away. Um, you really don't want to have to run 10 meter cables from one side of the lab all the way to the other. Um, it's kind of cumbersome. For DC experiments, it's probably fine, but if you're running impedance, if you connect a 10 meter cable, you will not be able to measure the same thing that you measured with the 60 centimeter cable. Um, I think Chris touched base on that on a previous webinar if you wanna take a look at it, but yeah, the flexibility of being able to remove any one channel and, and move it to a different location in the lab, um, I think is a pretty nice thing. Also, if, you, if you're doing any bipotentiostat work, uh, multiple working electrodes in the same solution, on the back of the 1010, you see the sync cable right here. Uh, you can sync everything up. So one potential stat would be the, the master and the rest of the surfs. Um, and, and that way you can do multiple working electrodes in a single solution. Uh, you, you have to have the potential stats synced up. In order to do that, they need to be floating. And all the potential stats are floating. So, so our systems are, are able to do that kind of stuff. Um, you can also sync up the 600 pluses and the 3000. Just one thing to note is that the 3000 or the 600 plus, they can be synced together. They can also be synced to other uh, 600 pluses, but, but only the references can be synced together with another reference. Only the interfaces can be synced with another interface. Um, just that's, that's the way they're designed um, and, and to sync up a, a 600 plus to a 1010, that's just gonna cause issues. Um, you're not able to do that. Just keep that in mind. But um, and, any other questions? about the cells or the systems or, or maybe you just have a general question. Maybe you have a more, um, uh, uh, you have your own design of cell and, and maybe you need help trying to figure out how you're gonna set that up. Um, one thing I didn't talk about too much was pressure inside the cells. All these cells, they're, they're made of glass. They're not meant to be pressurized. Um, I do believe we're gonna have a webinar coming up soon uh, potentially that will address those kind of custom cells and, and uh, high temperature, high pressure uh, uh, cells. Um, so keep, keep an eye out for that if, if you're dealing with those kind of setups. Andrew, I have a, I have a question here. Uh, somebody just asked, what's the best way to heat samples? I mean, I know we saw jacketed cells there, but are there other ways? That, is there one better than the other? I don't think there's any particular way to heat a sample, especially um, without discussing what the sample is. I think your biggest concern really should be what temperature am I heating it to? Can the cell uh, itself, can, 
can this cell and all the wetted materials or unwetted materials in here, can they handle that temperature? Um, think about that. So, so for instance, for the Euro cell here, um, you're, you're looking at probably um, PTFE, I think is probably gonna be the limiting uh, factor in how hot you can go. And, and I think that's gonna be about 140, um, 140F, I believe. Yeah, close, close to maybe 80, 80C, yeah, maybe a little bit higher. I forget exactly what the value is. Either way, if, if you get what I'm talking about here, think about all these little components and can they withstand whatever heat you're, you're, you're looking at. Um, also the cables. So your cables here, can they withstand the heat that you might be applying? Um, so what, what I'm really thinking about with that is uh, people, they like to put cells into ovens. And, and do experiments that way. And, and they always called like, can, can I put my cell in the oven? Like, yes, you can do that. Uh, how about the cables? And like, well, probably not. You're probably gonna have to somehow adapt uh, the cables to withstand that, that kind of temperature. Um, but in terms of heating the sample, flow it through the jacket. Uh, you could put it within um, uh, you know, a controlled environment such as uh, uh, um, an oven or something like that. But um, it probably depends on on what your sample is and what you're trying to achieve. But by default, I would say, yeah, the jacketed version flowing a, um, um, a controlled uh, fluid, controlled temperature in there and, and using um, different thermocouples, syncing them up to the potentiostat to make sure that you have uh, uh, good isotherms of your data um, is, is really what you're going for. But if, if you're looking to heat up your sample, give us a call. We'll always tell you if, if we think it's a good idea or at least give our input into what you're trying to do. Okay. Uh, I, I don't have any more questions. I don't know if any of the other guys pick some up during the talk or not. I did not. What's uh, I have a time on here? What are we looking at? About 12.30. So yeah, I've been going for about an hour and a half. I, I wouldn't mind slowing down. I am in my garage where there's no AC and I have some pretty bright light shining on me. So I don't think I'm going to show my sweaty face anymore. <laughs> <for the camera. laughs> it's getting pretty warm in here. Okay. So well, if we were to break for lunch, I have no problem doing that. Okay. Well, then we can, we can stop here and uh, just want to thank everybody for attending. Thank you, Andrew, for this. Um, again, the video a recording of this is going to be available tomorrow. Look for our Friday focus email. Uh, we have a new tech note coming out on accelerated uh, corrosion testing on coated samples. Uh, and then we also will have a link to this video in there. And then uh, keep watching for more webinars. So thank you again, everybody, and have a good day. I have to round up all these little.